A lot of people watched the, the, the Periscope from yesterday. The, thank you for the good feedback. And uh, there are plenty of, or some shit without having any context in which how it applies to daily fantasy. Really, that, that's, that's the difference. It's like I have no, no projection models are fine. But that's only one part of the equation. That's the sports side of the equation. How do you apply that now to the system, the competitive environment in which you're, you're applying the data, right? You're applying that somewhere, right? If, you, if, you, if, you're pl if you're playing a contest, I mean, all the different sites, Draft or FanDuel, Fantasy Draft, DraftKings, wherever, wherever the fuck you need to play line. What, what other sites are there? Or your league, if you're in a season-long league. Right, and you, you have a scoring system. You have a, a roster construction. You have a everything is unique. You have to take those things in the projections if you do a model of some type, and then apply it to your system. Right, so something that oh he projects very well, but well, what's his salary? If you're playing salary based daily fantasy, oh it is even on my team. Right, I mean like you could come if you're playing season long and everyone has different players, like who cares? Right, you may need that. In order, if you're playing a head-to-head -head matchup in season long, go, well, he has these highly projected players that are going to be starting for him, and this guy's on a bye week, and like you're, you, you have a lot of shadier players, but maybe you need to take more risk. Maybe because you see good players and good matchups and good projected value in your opponent's lineup. So now, based on your scoring system, you may go, okay, maybe I take a shot at a boomer bust option on my team because my consistent good options are either on buy, they're injured, or something like that. But you're doing it based on your opponent. Your opponent has looks like he has a much more narrow range of outcomes to get an X, you know, type of score, and you don't. So instead of going, well, I, I, I want to make sure I get four points here. Well, maybe that's not the pro proper strategy. Maybe the proper strategy is go, I'm going to go for the guy in my lineup. I'm going to start the guy that either gets zero or gets 15. Because if I put it in my projections, like the way my model shows, I'm going to lose by 12 points more often than not. So it's like, let me, let me look for the outlier results rather than just take the safe points. So that's what I mean by applying the projections, applying your data, applying the matchups, the target shares, the... Fucking whatever, whatever the fuck you want to do with the with the the actual stats of the sport, how do you apply it to the game in which you're playing? Okay, so to so to to to, to, go, to go along even further in the game environment, the number one factor. I don't think I I I, uh, I said it more succinctly enough. Overall, in any competitive game environment, the number one factor. That will determine your success or failure. Number one, by far, is the strength of your opponent. That that's the number one factor, right? Not how well you could project players. Not well how well you could construct your lineup. Not how well you can do anything. But the biggest factor is how well or how bad your opponent or your field of opponents can. So in poker, there's the, the constant. Constant reminder, if you're playing low-limit poker in your card room, online, wherever, and you're playing in a game where people are drinking, no one gives a shit, and they're playing too many hands or whatever, uh, the the thinking about in terms of, oh, well, I need to balance my ranges, I need to, you know, I, I my frequencies, you know, all the game theory stuff that poker players think about is marginal difference, right? You're going to make more money off of playing strong hands and strong positions, Right, you're exploiting the fact that your opponents are playing weak hands in weak positions, starting hands. So the math just you just play straightforward and bet for value, and that's it. Right, boring as fuck. Right, you wait for aces, you wait for ace king, you wait for you wait for the situations where you're getting positive expected value, and then when you hit your hand, you bet it. Right, if you think you have the best hand, bet the hand. That's it. You're gonna get called too often in a game of that type that to do any type of fucking trickery, right? Any type of fancy plays. Now, when you get to where it's very competitive environment, then you have to, you can't just rely on the strength of your starting hands. You can't just rely on betting for value. People are more observant. People won't call you in spots where they would have called you in another game. And you're not going to get your value when, you know, you flop a full house or some shit, right? So it's dependent on your opponent. And DFS is the same way. 
If you're playing against weak opponents, you don't need to do fan... You're going to make more money off of them making mistakes and you just, like, playing boring than you making great... Oh, I project this guy two points higher. I'm going to play him and everyone's going to play that guy. Like, you don't make as much money in this cases where people are bad or your field is below average. Enough to the point where if you just play boring... You make your ROI and your fucking plus EV, you're good, right? So if you're if you're playing high stakes, if you're playing top end opponents, if you're playing in a sport in a niche sport that it's a lot of experts or whatever, yeah, then you may have to play off the board. You may have to play. It's like I'm going to push this little edge here. I'm going to play this guy. I know not many people are playing him, but I have I my projection model, my my assessment is that this guy is better than that guy. Uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to push that edge against opponents that are not going to make many mistakes. So the difference between that one point difference may make the difference between profiting and not profiting. But in a game where people are like, oh, I'm just going to play fucking, you know, I'm, I'm going to play I'm going to play Marshawn Lynch instead of fucking TJ Eldon or some shit, right? And where we're like, like they're obviously underpriced, you know, like Marcus Val Valdez Scantling did this past NFL. I mean, just play him. Just fuck it. Just... They're going to make other mistakes that just fucking plug them in and don't worry about it. In the low limit, and if you, if you see that you're playing against weaker opponents. So that's, in general, that's always, that's why when I say that I play conservatively, I'm a Joey Knish type what, whatsoever. With what I know, what I could quantify high probability situations, I'm willing to uh, give up equity in order to get higher certainty. That's what I'm talking about. That I'm, I'm typically not playing $1,000 head-to-head head -head matches. I may play a lot of volume, but I'm playing a lot of volume in the lower stakes. And it depends on the sport. NFL is softer, right? NBA is a little, little bit sharper. Soccer is extremely sharp, okay? So the play style depends. And also you can make lineups depending on that. So when people go, oh, I make one cash lineup and that's it, like, that's not necessarily the best strategy. If you're going to play, I'm going to play uh, $1.00. $3 contest, double ups. I'm going to play 500 in volume in that, but I'm also going to play, uh, you know, some $100 head-to-head head -head matches. Maybe you have two different lineups for that, right? Two different, two different player pools, two different types of situations. You don't have to play one the whole fucking way. You don't have to because it's different opponents. So your strategy doesn't have to change based on the opponent, but because your opponent changes, there has to be some type of strategic difference between playing one person over the other. Right? Defense matters in that case, right? That, that That's when defense matters. Your play style matters. Okay. So that, in general, is what I'm talking about. So getting into ranges of outcomes. Like, I really want to really bang on the drum of projections or ranges of outcomes. And this is why, when I say I poo-poo projections, is that I don't find... I personally, in, the way, in my decision-making, the game theory of DFS, don't care as much, that much about a guy being projected for 7.2 points versus 7.6 points, okay? I look at that and go, 6 to 8? Is that a high probability outcome? Give them to me, right? That I'm doing the same thing. Anytime someone says that they don't use a model, like everyone uses a model. Everyone has weights, right? There's some bad players that they wait, you know, fucking it's this guy's birthday, gotta play him, right? And that's weighted too high, right? Maybe Maybe that should be in your model, maybe it shouldn't. But it should be weighted like this and not like that. So even if you're not putting it on a spreadsheet or you're building an Excel fucking Python solver, whatever the fuck thing is, you're still doing that, right? You're still creating a money. You're still looking at a player pool going, what are the prices? What are the expected outcomes? What are the range? This guy is boomer boss. This guy, you, you're doing all of that. Even if you, even if you, I don't know math very well and I, uh, I don't, I don't have an algorithm or whatever. The, you're still doing that in your head. To some extent. Go, I'm not going to play a fucking quarterback against a good defense, right? And, well, that's, that's you're waiting defense, right? In your head. I'm not going to play a running back against a good offensive line or, you know, this guy, you know, this this wide receiver's out or this guy's going to cover this guy. You're, you're doing all of that modeling in your head, right? By making those assessments. You're not putting an actual number on it, but that is what you're doing. But you have to think in terms of ranges of outcomes, okay? So, like, to go back into the case of ranges of outcomes and how they differ for the contest types that you're in, 
Remember, you don't get paid extra for winning a double up, right? You get paid the same as if you came in the 55th percentile. So you're perfectly fine. So to, to take two players' projections, and they both come out mean, projection come out to eight. You have two different types. Like, you could have multiple... They could have... All these players have different ranges of outcomes. So, for instance, like I showed yesterday with the, you know, the distribution curve, you have a, a range of outcomes like this. Okay, I know everything's backwards. So, I, I, is this backwards or whatever? So, I mean, maybe it doesn't help because now the numbers look funny. Uh, but the frequency... If you see here, like an eight points, it's right down the middle. So 12% of the time, he gets eight. 11% of the time, he gets seven. 10% of the time, he gets nine. 8% 10, right? All of, and that's the percentage probability of them getting these scores, okay? Very concentrated in the middle. If you see that middle range of six to 10, like what I say in my head, like uh, about around eight, right? I, I put little barriers. These, the, I'm showing you this. Even though, like, these are just examples. Like, this is not, like, you don't make these charts for, like, every fucking player. Like, I'm just using this so so people can understand the concept. So, inside this, 51% of the time, they get between 6 or 10, right? And then certain percentages of time they underperform, certain percentages of time they overperform. Certain very small percentage of time they really underperform or really overperform. So, for uh, an environment where, in a contest, where... You care more about getting secure points, right? You have to see, like, the combination of, like, when they, when they how often do they underperform? 24% of the time. How often do they overperform? The combination of these two. The combination of all these three. The combination of all those three, right? So these are the probabilities. So you're looking for, in this middle range, a high probability chance for cash games that they score in that range, and then dependent on the price. I'll get into that in a little bit. Okay? So you take a more boom or bust play, where it's still the same mean projection of 8, but they only hit that 8-7% of the time. They only hit 7-6% uh, of the time. But they hit, if you see, they hit 4%, 4%, 4%. If you add all these up, like 25% of the time, they really outperform their value. 25% of the time, they don't, right? But now, that middle range is less of a percentage. They're more boom, they're more bust. So if you take a look compared to the more consistent guy, more consistent guy has these ones or twos in the high range and ones or twos in the low range. So more likely they're not putting up 20 points, right? But co combined, the high, the boom or bust guy puts it up more often, but doesn't put in the middle as often, okay? So that's why, although they're both projected to have eight points, right? And as a mean projection, probably... The better cash play, if at the same price, like if they're 4,000, right, and he gets eight points, that would be what we call 2x value, right? That's typically in DFS parlance, two times their salary, okay? So that would be 4,000. If this guy gets eight at 4,000, it's still the same, but he only gets eight 7% of the time. You know, like this, right in this middle range, he only gets 2x this percentage of the time. This guy more consistent guy, gets 2x much more of a percentage of time. Doesn't get 0x or 4x as much of the time as the boomer bus guy. And then, as I see, show you here on salary up and salary down, is that if 4x value, like this guy could be boomer bus, but if this guy wasn't 4,000, if this guy was 1,000, right, 2x is really here, right? If he's 1,000, all he needs is 4 points to get 2x in your lineup, right? He only needs two points. So the risk, I mean, the reward, like this whole big part over here is all luxury to you. So for 1,000, maybe even though he is boomer bust, he's more likely to get zero than he, the other guy, the more consistent guy, but for four times less salary, you don't, you don't need a 2x score, right? You don't, you don't need, you don't need at the same, you don't need eight points at, at 1,000, Getting two points is the equal, is the same. So as the salary goes down, the boomer bus plays could become cash plays because the probability of that happening versus the point per dollar you get is worth it, or at least equal to the other guy, right? The more consistent guy. And the more consistent guy, let's say he's more expensive, right? Let's say as the salary goes up, yes, he consistently gets eight, but he, then that percentage only represents one X value. 
right? So you now you're paying up for a high probability, but you're really not getting anything for it, right? You're not getting any more points. You're just getting more security in that. So as it goes up, sometimes you'll be more willing to pay for that security, but to some extent, right? You wouldn't pay 20000 for this guy, right? Well, I'm definitely, I'm more likely to get eight points. Yeah, but eight points is at 20K is, is what? Not even half value, right? This guy, at minimum price, it's like, well, he can put up a zero a lot of times, but he's fucking 500 bucks. So it's like, why not? If, but if this guy's $10,000, you don't even think about him in cash, right? You don't even think, because in order to get 2X value, that's 20 points. That's like a 1% chance, right? Off, off the fucking chart, right? But you're not, you're not making these charts. Like, these, these are what projections are. But this is how you're thinking in your head. So when you take a look at a guy like Christian McCaffrey this week and go, okay, he's going to be on the field 95% of the time, get 15 carries, three catches, whatever. Like, you're probably thinking that, well, I mean, I'm going to get 12 points. I'm probably going to get 15, get 18, 12 to 18, probably not going to get five, may not get 30, right? But he's 8,000. So to get 2x value, get 16 points. Like, you have to assess, what's the probability of him getting around 16 points? 12 to 20, right? You don't have to have exact fucking numbers. Are you looking at his matchup? Yeah, you're, you're considering all of this when you, when you make your projection. When you make your, even if it's in your head, right? If, you know, you're not looking at Christian McCaffrey and going, this is what it looks like, uh, well, the consistent option. You're not looking at Christian McCaffrey going, this is his graph, like, every matchup. Every game, every situation. Let's say Cam Newton's out. Let's say Devin Funches is out. Let's say Greg Olson is back. I mean, the variables change, but you're still, you're just changing the distribution curve for the matchup, for all the other stuff, all the other evidence and all the other data. You're making this, but it's still a probability curve, right? You're looking at a probability curve, not an exact fucking, it's going to be eight, right? Because they're both eight. But they both have different probabilities of hitting eight versus the other scores that he could hit. And then it all and then you have to weight it for salary. So guys that are more consistent, like weigh the salary of like he's more often gonna get two X, but he's kind of overpriced, but how overpriced is he? Right? If he's two thousand overpriced, you probably don't play him regardless. The variables by differ, but the probability remains the same. Well, it depends on the matchup. Probability still depends on the matchup. I mean, you. I mean, Marcus Val Valdez Scantling. If Allison and Cobb were in, obviously all these probabilities go way down because he's going to see less snaps. He's going to be the fourth wide receiver. So this coming game that he's playing, if Allison is back, like his likelihood of hitting an eight point score or whatever, whatever, whatever projected score, is going to be lower, right, than it is. So you have to do every every week, every matchup, everything. It's all. It's not gonna. It's not gonna remain constant. But the, it's the same type of player in the type of matchup. Julio Jones this coming week is what seventy nine hundred. If he was three thousand, would you care that he gets no touchdowns? No, he puts up plenty of. If he gets a touchdown, that's a fucking bonus for three thousand. But if Julio Jones this week was ten thousand. Do you play him? Well, I mean, but he's gotten this many targets. He'll get a hundred. You know, he could easily get nine for a hundred. It's like, well, that's 19 points. But at 10K, is 19 points worth it for 10K? Right? Is 19 points worth it for 8K? Is 19 points worth it for 6K? For 4K? As you go down, you take on the risk. Right? You don't care about the touchdowns. Gurley at 10K this week, it's like, boy, he better get in the fucking end zone. Right? Look at air yards. Yeah, but that hasn't... You've already done that, Steve. This is We're past that. That's already accounted for in the projection, right? This has nothing to do with projections. You've already done that. All of that you've already done. But it's still a probability. John Brown having a lot of air yards doesn't mean he's going to have fucking 200 yards this week. What's the probability of him having 200 yards? It's X percent. What's the probability he's going to have... Six catches for 50 yards. What's the probability? He's going to have three catches for 80 yards. What's the probability? You have to think in terms of that. Like So obviously people with high air yards have more boom or bust potential. They're bright. They get a lot of long shots. And maybe he comes down with one more often. He regresses to the mean and comes down more this week. But that's still a probability. It's not You're not sure that's going to happen. 
but it's going to happen more likely than fucking Tyler Croft is going to get three touchdowns in the Bengals game, right? There's a probability to that. The probability isn't zero, but it's fucking small, right? So when you look at air yards, when you look at uh, all the target share stuff, all the everything, all the yards per rushing average and all, all of the, that's all that's all incorporated into the projection. But when you look at the projection, you have to look at the range of outcomes, right? Not the projection. Not like John Brown's 5,600, 50, what is he, 5,500 this week? He got, what, nine targets last week? And like, okay, so what's his project? What would be his projection? You could put a number on it. You'd say 12. Okay. But his 12 is different than Quincy Inunua's 12, right? Quincy Inunua has le much less air yards, but still has, if you want to say, the same amount of targets. But is his targets as valuable as John Brown's? No, it isn't, right? It isn't. John Brown gets long distance, more long distance targets. He's the number one receiver on the outside. Like, you have to look at all the matchup. And then based on that information, that's where you're making the probability distribution curves, right? That you have to think in terms of you've already made the projection. You've already thought about all of that, right? This is past that, right? It doesn't, putting eights and nines and tens and 14s, saying Julio Jones is projected to 18 points, doesn't matter in and of itself. Does that make it good for a cash game? Does it make it good for a head-to-head? -head? Does it make it good for a millie maker? Does it make it good for FanDuel versus DraftKings, right? Half PPR versus PPR is touchdown equity, is the salary scale. We see on FanDuel that quarterbacks are more widely priced versus DraftKings where they're narrowly priced right? That matters. So the predictions always stay the same, right? So it's every week you make, oh, okay, I think this guy gets 18 points. On average, more often 18, but what's the probability of that happening? And then based on the scoring system that you're on, okay? So once you look at the range of outcomes, now you want to take a look at the range of outcomes for your entire lineup, okay? So for instance, for like a cash game, like, like when you just have to hit a 55th percentile score, you know, you're looking at score, you know, the most likely amount of points. So let's say you're playing a lineup. I know this is all backwards. I, I can't write backwards or something. Uh, so you have all nine positions for, like, NFL. And I'm, I'm making the example very, very simple for the sake of the explanation purposes. So in each position, they have, you can only score one of three points, zero, five, or ten, right? What percentage chance will this guy score zero, ten percent? 10%, 10. And 80% of the time, they'll score five. So picture that really consistent, narrow distribution curve type of guy. So let's say you put nine of them in your lineup, right? 10% of the time, they score zero. 10% of the time, they score 10. 80% of the time, they score five. If you average that out, that's five points, right? That's five fucking points. So that's 45 in your entire roster. That's the same as the boom, more boom or bust guys. Zero. 20% of the time, they score 0. 20% of the time, they score 10. 60% of the time, they score 5. Still a 5-point projection. But if you see that the guy that scores 5 points 80% of the time, the total amount, the chances of scoring 0, which is all of your guys getting these 10% chances, are this low. The same thing as all of them getting 10 points for 90 points. Same thing. The chances of it coming exactly... At 45, with 80%, I mean, there are some chances where one gets zero and one gets 10, and it balances it out. But to get exactly all of your guys on five is about 13%, right? And everything in between could be represented on this distribution curve, okay, for your entire lineup. So, And we put the quadrants like I did for the player. So more often than not, you're somewhere within this range, now, most likely, you're not getting zero, and most likely, you're not getting above there. So as far as this type of lineup in a GPP where you're rewarded for this end, it doesn't happen that often. It doesn't fucking happen often enough. But the likelihood of you getting fucking, fucking zero is very small. And in a place where you don't get penalized for being too small is probably cash games. So now take a look at your overall lineup if you play all the guys that have 60% chance, you know, the more boomer busty types, right? The likelihood of you getting zero is a small number, but it's actually 512 times more likely than the other guy. And the same thing for the 90-point score. 
the 45 point score, which is everyone coming in at 60% exactly, is about 1%, right? What well, 1%, but I mean, coming in 44 and 43 is also like 1%. So that, all of those 1% put together gets you this distribution graph. So you see a lot more in the high and a lot more in the low and less right down the middle, right over here, okay? It, of your total lineup together. Obviously, there are more of a chance of one guy getting 10 and one guy getting zero, so it cancels each other out. And that's represented in the middle right here. So like someone like JM to win, who I read his article, I'm a subscriber of uh, uh, one, week uh, one Week Season, uh, and I, for the price, I highly recommend it. Uh, and I, I read his stuff on Roto Grinders before. Uh, it, do I agree with every take that he has? Absolutely not. But I mean, it's like 20,000 fucking words, and I want as much information as possible, right? Especially when it comes to the sports side. I deal with this stuff. The sport type of stuff, I, okay, I don't kind of agree with you there. And my model in my head gets adjusted for that. But Jay DeWin talks a lot about, because he plays cash, talked about spiked weeks, right? He wants guys that could possibly have spike weeks. And what he's really saying is looking at a lineup that's not fully like this with the boomer bust guys, but having a boomer bust or one or two of them that have high probabilities, you know, you take a look at the, at the boomer bust type of guy, right, that has less of a middle but more up and down, that having one guy with a spiked week could make up for duds, right? Now, would you put a lot of those guys in your lineup? Probably not in cash. But, like, playing the guy where it's like, well, uh, this guy has a very high, ch a much higher chance of putting up an actual outlier 4x value score that maybe he's actually be a better play than a guy that's more consistently going to just put up 2x and probably never going to get to a 4x value. And I'm going to choose to play the boomer busty guy slightly more than the, than the consistent guy. Because if I do get a spiked week, if I do get a 4X score, it'll make up for another mistake, another dud in my lineup. So I, I don't have to be right everywhere, okay? I, that is an approach to take for cash games. And I think overall, it equals each other out as far as just going down and taking the consistent, you know, fucking high probability right down your fucking lineup type of thing. Uh, but it's it come it EV wise it's probably the same it's just probably a slightly higher variance right so it I think his approach is fine but that's in soccer we talk about high goal scoring odds goal dependent forwards for 10k because there aren't many good options at forward and uh, instead of overpaying paying 7500 for Andros Townsend it's like I'll just pay 11k for Kane and he'll score more often times than not that you know if he does I can make it up elsewhere type of shit right? So it does make sense how he plays versus how I play versus how other cash players play. EV wise, it probably comes out to about the same. So you have your overall lineup will have a range of outcomes like this. And for cash games, you're looking for this middle to be high probability. Okay. So let's move on to now cash games also have ownership. And I talked about that yesterday, as far as ownership matters in cash games. Anything that your opponent does that affects the performance and your success in a contest has to be a variable, right? You're not playing in a vacuum. Like, Don't worry about ownership, but just play. Well, if some guy's 100% owned and he puts up a million points, can you win? And if you don't have them, no. So obviously it matters what your opponents do. So let's take a situation just like before with the 0 5, 10 guys, right? The guys that... 10% of the time, they come in 0, 80% they come in 5, and 10% they come in 10, right? So these guys, A versus B. So A is the consistent guy with the 80% right in the middle. B is the little bit more boomer bust, right? Not highly boomer bust, but obviously, you know, twice as much on the outside, okay? Let's look at the prop now. Let's say you're choosing between, they're the same price, I'm trying to make everything constant for this example. They're same price, same position, same everything. And the decision you have to make is one or the other. Okay? So let's say you make A and other people make B. Okay? So based on these percentages of how often, 
How often does A make zero points and B make zero points? 2% of the time. A makes zero, B makes five, 6% of the time, right? A makes 10, B makes zero, 2% of the time. Five and five in the 80s and 60s are represented right here. So 48% of the time, A makes five and B makes five. That's 48%, of the, but if they're the same score, it doesn't matter, it's a wash. So it didn't matter which one you chose. So if they're the same, if your leverage score is gonna be zero, it doesn't matter which one you take, right? If your opponent takes, if you take A and it gets zero and your opponent takes B and they get 10, well, you're 10 points behind, right? So how often are you 10 points behind, five points behind, five points ahead, 10 points ahead based on these percentages? And that's right here. More than half the time, it's zero. More than half the time, it's not gonna matter, right? 22% of the time, you're going to be leveraged five points. 22% of the time, you're going to be leveraged negatively five points. You're going to have to make that up elsewhere, right? 2% of the time, 2% of the time, plus or minus 10, right? For this one player, for this one situation, and obviously this is a curve. You could have a percentage that has three, have a percentage that has seven. I mean, like, I'm just using this very, very simple example of the concept that you think about. So... It's like in a head-to-head -head match, you think in terms of this, right? If my opponent's going to play B and I'm going to play A, what are my upsides and what are my downsides? And what's the probability of those upsides and downsides happening, okay? Then you have to relate it to your whole lineup. So this gets multiplied by, if you constantly are playing guys that other people are not playing, the range of your leverage gets wider, right? If you're playing guys that no one's playing, Right? If you're playing it's guys that are no one playing, that you're either going to do really well or really bad because, you know, you're not going to get to these zeros where it didn't matter which one you chose. Right? If you chose all bad players and the other guy chose all good players, you're fucking, you're dead. You're fucking dead. So you want to do that for your whole lineup. But let's say you're in a contest. This is like head to head. But let's say you're in a contest with 100 people, 500 people, a double up, right? A double up with 1,000 people, $5 single entry double up with fucking 2,000 people. Who, who knows? If if these percentages apply, if everyone owned B and you were the only one with A, right? If 100% of your opponents own B and you own A and A puts up 10 less points, well, 2% of the time, you're going to be fucking, you're going to be, the whole field, the whole field has 10 points on you. The whole field has 10 points on you. So you can represent that on a graph similar to this. So you'll take a look at the leverage scores of plus 10 points, plus five points, doesn't matter, zero, minus five, minus 10. In this example where they can only score zero, five, or 10, right? If your opponents have it 100% owned, these are the percentages of times that that leverage happens. So if someone is owned 100% of the time and you... Get minus five on there, that's 22%. But if he's only 90% owned, it's 19.8. If it's 80% owned, it goes down from there. So if the guy that you're comparing it to is only 10% owned, and you have a, a, a score of five points lower than that, it only affects 2.2% of the field, right? In this example, right? So if you think the guy is only going to be 10% owned that you're considering, that other people will have, and you'd rather play another guy... Like, it's only going to affect you 2.2% of the time, negatively. It's going to be positive 2.2% of the time, right? But as the ownership goes up on a player, it more positively or negatively affects you. So you, ha you have to think in terms of that. If you're going to fade a guy that's 70% owned, and, they put, and, and you're going to play a different guy in this specific situation, like, you have to, you have to know that, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the time, like, Five points may be the difference between you bubbling in a fucking double up, right? At 70% ownership. So if a guy's only 10% owned, you don't have to worry as much. That's why when people say you don't have to worry about ownership in cash games, on big slates, 13-game slates, where ownership differences may, may be only in these ends of the spectrum, you're comparing a 28% owned guy to a 22% owned guy, it probably doesn't, ma it only makes maybe a 4% difference in what you choose. Now, 
you have to add that up every player on your on your on your roster. That's why I said like you have to look at that as a range, like anything. You look at it as a fucking range. So you take the leverage of all the players. You know, you have nine players, right? So you have four, you have six, you have one, you have whatever, and then you have a range right at the end. That's your total risk range of possibilities based on what you think ownership will be. And there are projected ownerships out there, but this is not something that you put a number to. I want to really, really hammer it in. You don't make these. You don't, how the fuck do people know a high ownership player because the industry is high on a player? You look at someone and you go, I think everyone noticed that this guy's underpriced. I don't think he's a great play even for that price, but I think a lot of people will go there. Or you look at the construction type. Oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of cheap running backs available. So I think the high end wide receivers are going to be more owned. You don't have to put a number on it. You don't have to say 18. You have to know just in general. Put a range in your head. I think this guy is going to be owned. This past I faded Connor in cash this past week because I didn't think he'd be owned enough to hurt me based on why based on this concept, right? Based on this concept. If I thought Connor was going to be 60% owned and I preferred to play Melvin Gordon instead or something, I probably would have played Connor because it would have hurt me too much. But I thought Connor's ownership would be 20 to 30%. He came in at 28, right? I don't need to know 28. I don't need to know 24. I don't need to know 32. I need to know around there. I need to, that's what I'm doing in my head, right? I'm not putting math together. I'm just thinking in terms of the slate and how NFL cash games are and how, and just all of that in my head. So that's why the range of outcomes, when you say like Julio Jones, 16, I don't think 16. I think, uh, I think he'll get 14 to 18 ish. Like that's good enough for me. I don't need to have 16.8. I I don't care about 16.8. I don't care about ownership. Is this guy going to be 42% owned or 36% owned? It's about the, that means about the same that your decision is not going to change. Right. If I look at a slate and I go, Jesus Christ, I think this guy's going to be 60% owned, right? First week, Connor, 45% mattered. You're absolutely right. I played him. I mean, he was so significantly underpriced, right? But the fact that 55% of the field didn't play him is just fucking ridiculous, right? There's the edge. There's the thing, like I said before, about you're not making money based on the brilliance of your own play. You're making the money off the stupidity of everyone else, right? So just plug him in. Just pl fucking plug in that fucking guy, Right? But that's the same type of thing. You look at Connor at 4,500 that first week and go, Jesus, this guy's going to be heavily owned, right? Do I need to know he's going to be 70% owned versus 62% owned? No, it doesn't change my decision. I'm playing him, right? I'm playing him because he's the best value regardless if he's going to be 100% owned, right? It doesn't change anything. The, 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 the eight point here and there, it doesn't change anything. So I look at this slate coming up and I go, hmm, is Julio, how high, highly owned is Julio Jones going to be in cash games? Is he going to be 25% owned? Is he going to be 45% owned? How about Christian McCaffrey? Is he going to be 50% owned? Is he going to be 20% owned? That's a big difference, right? The difference between is he going to be 45% owned or 38% owned? It's about the same. Fucking bad, about the same. The higher the over under the high line ownership players in that game, you're absolutely right, Right? You expect the high total players to be higher owned, right? But you don't need to know. You, you don't have to. You have to make. You don't have to, to do with the math to go. Is it twenty two or twenty eight for your decision to change, right? You could be wrong. You could be fucking wrong. There are plenty of times that I go. I don't think. I don't think people are going to pay this for this guy and and use this type of construction. And they come in and it's like fucking forty five percent owned. And I go, Jesus Christ! I thought it would be fifteen percent owned, right? That's something you do yourself. Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times when the more that you play DFS, the more you get a sense on how other people play DFS. So you look and you go, I think Vance McDonald's going to be fucking 45% owned. I don't even think he's a good play for the fucking 3,700, but I think a lot of other people think he's a good play and he's going to be 45% owned, right? Is he 42? Is he 47? That's still fucking high, right? For a 12 game goddamn slate, right? That I have to at least utilize that knowledge and go... Do I take him? Do I not take him? Do I play a different construction? If I don't play Vance McDonald and I go down there and I go up here, now I'm really off a, a positive construction type, right? Cameron Bla Brait will be played in every GPP. GPP is slightly different. Like, this applies to GPP, but I'm going primarily to cash games. So you look at that. Are you playing the international friendly? No. So you take a look at this. This is the mindset. 
I'm not saying that you make spreadsheets and you make charts, and I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying that the guys that make spreadsheets and make charts and make projections are fucking full of shit. I'm not saying that. But most of the projection, nearly all of the projection models you see, focus, have nothing to do with the game of DFS. They have nothing to do with the game part of it. There are, there, there, Guys like Josh Hermsmeyer and Derek Cardi and uh, fucking what Josh ADHD and who, who uh, Kevin Cole, all the analytics guys or whatever in around the community or whatever you know the, guys, the Bales and Fantasy Labs and all they're putting the projections in based on they're looking to to, to project uh, performance of NFL players. You have to take that and then go okay let's say. You can use other people's projections and still treat it as a range of outcomes. Don't look at an 18 and go, he's going to get me 18. Look at it as, what's the probability of him getting an 18? More so. And then you have to take that and then you have to apply it to the game that which you're playing. None of the projection models do that, right? None of the projection models go, I mean, they'll, they'll, I will apply it to the DraftKings scoring system. And now we're putting in all the, all the stuff and then uh, we predict uh, the 22.2 points. Right? But that's still a probability of it happening. But still, you're in a game with other opponents. If you're, if you're playing in a double up where all your opponents are playing injured players, does it matter if the difference between an 18 points and a 22 points? No. Play guys that get any points, right? They're, your opponent's going to get zero, so who gives a fuck? Right? Play them goddamn backups. Doesn't matter. Right? You could tell me, like the example uh, that I wanted to give, because I was listening to like Aggression of the Mean on, uh, on Roto Grinders. Uh, of if you could project for sure, guaranteed, 100% certainty that tomorrow's game, right, tomorrow's, tomorrow, whatever slate it is, that uh, Odell Beckham Jr. will get seven catches for 100 yards and one touchdown. Okay, guaranteed. The probability is 100%. So that's seven for 100 and one touchdown. Here's the question. Do you play him? The answer to that is you can't, there is no answer until what are you playing, right? You projected perfectly, seven for 100 for one touchdown. Now, obviously on DraftKings, that equates to 26 points. Seven catches, 100 yards, plus the 100-yard bonus, and a six-point touchdown. So that's 26 points. So now, what, now you are applying it to the scoring system. Now I ask the question again, do you play him? You still can't answer. It still depends. It still depends. Even if you know for sure he's going to put up 26 DraftKings points, it still depends. Do you play him? Because the next question is, what's his salary? What is his salary? I mean, we know what his salary is on tomorrow's slate. I'm just saying, in a, in a, is this, if his salary is $100, do you play him? Absolutely. Right? You, you plug him in and don't even think about it. If you know for sure, 100% probability, he's going to get 26 points. If he's only priced at 100 bucks in a 50K salary, every lineup everywhere, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's say he's $45,000. Or like, uh, what would be the minimum? Or whatever, 43,000, 40, whatever, 40,000. Let's say he's 40,000. But you know for sure he's getting 26 points. Do you play him? Do you play him? You're guaranteed 26 points, but you're paying four, to th which means the other nine spots on your roster, you have to play fucking 2K players, right? Do you play them? There still isn't an answer. Most people right now are going to go, we are, obviously you don't play them. Obviously you don't play them. And that's wrong. There are plenty of, t plenty of times where you'd play them, even at 40,000. Here, there we go. Only if your lineup has the highest probability of winning. Now we're starting to talk. Now we're even adding another layer on top of it. Remember the situation where my opponent is playing injured players, right? Injured players that aren't even fucking, they're not even active for the game. He's guaranteed to get a zero, right? If you're telling me that Odell Beckham Jr. is guaranteed to get me 26 points, guaranteed, there's he's not getting injured, he's not, he, he, that, it will positively be 26, 26 points. I play him against that opponent. And then whatever punt, I, it doesn't matter the rest of my lineup. I'll put in backups. It, 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 who cares? If I know my opponent is going to score a zero, 
and I know Odell Beckham Jr. is going to score 26 points, and we're playing a $100 head-to-head, I win automatically. But you go 43, that, yeah, I'll win 26 to nothing. That's perfectly fine. Now, obviously, that's an extreme example. But the fact that that is an example means you have to take the contest type and the opponents that you're playing in consideration, not just the projection, the salary. How would you know that? Well, just like how would you know that it's 100% probability of Odell Beckham Jr. putting up 26 points? You wouldn't necessarily know it, but there's, there are probabilities. So when you take a look at someone's price and go, Todd Gurley is 10000 this coming Sunday. The likelihood of Todd Gurley putting up probably under 10 points is low. But him putting up 10 points is only one times value, right? If Todd Gurley was 5000 you'd play him. You don't know who the other guy is playing, though. You know how the weaknesses of your opponents. You absolutely do. You could, even, you could even track that. You could track and see how well you're doing $1 double-ups, big field double-ups, high entry volume double-ups. You could track all of that. The cash line is lower. Everyone knows that. Everyone sees that. You play a $1 double-up of, you know, in NFL or whatever, most sport, the lower stakes you go, typically the easier the games are. So if a cash line, if in, the, in the $25 single entry, whatever, the cash line is 143 in the $1 double up or whatever, down in the 229 man, whatever, the cash line could be 136, right? So you don't have to be as right, right? You don't have to put up as high of a score, usually. Mine is easy, I lose them all, okay. So if you're in contests where opponents will make more mistakes, you should take on less risk. So it doesn't mean, like, I'm just saying that all the variables that you're taking into account matter on the other variables. That's why when you listen to a podcast and someone says, I like this guy, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean, if you're listening to just a football podcast, I think AJ Green's going to explode the next game. What, what, is that, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. If AJ Green was... 40k salary who cares right you're probably in, in the normal dfs double ups right you can't have a 40k guy well i know I, he's gonna put up 200 yards and three touchdowns yeah but you, the rest of your lineup has backups in it that can't score any points so it doesn't matter who you like it doesn't matter who like oh i think this is a good matchup i think uh, whatever that's why on dfs podcast you hear i think this guy is a good value for the price i think this guy is uh, uh, more likely to do this versus that. that. Now we're starting to get into how the projections affect how you make decisions in Daily Fantasy. So if you listen to it like, I, uh, I'm going to rank 10 guys, 1 to 10. This is the best play. This is the second best play. This is the, well, how about on the, based on the price, based on the contest, based on, based on, based on your own risk tolerance, right? Some people will play a higher Expected value play, even though the variance is much higher. Some people have the risk tolerance to do that. They have the bankroll size or whatever. They, they, don't, they don't mind being more swingy if at the end run, it actually increases their ROI by 1% or 2%. Some people, they push edges like that. You see that in poker. I'm going to make a high variance play that I think if I did a million times over, I make 1% to 2% more money doing but in the process, I either win or lose $5,000. If you want to take on that risk, that actually is the more optimal move. But it's going to be like this, right? Yeah, I mean, and you're not going to be playing a sample size of a million fucking times. So if you can't afford to go like up and down like that, probably you don't make that play. You make the slightly less expected value play for the sake of not going broke. Those are the decisions you're making. This is a, DFS is a game of decisions. Any competitive ende endeavor is a game of decisions. How the projections, how you apply the projections to the decisions you're making makes what DFS is. So going to an optimizer and spinning out median projections and going, I'm going to play this in, in, I'm going to play this in the Millie Maker as well as in this 50-50, you're doing it wrong, right? They can't possibly be equal, Right? You have to expect different results based on doing that. Based on, okay, I'm just going to take some raw projection model and just spit out numbers and go, 
Well, over a million times, this, this score, did you see the aggregate score of 144. It's like, well, it depends. It depends. Does it go 144 this way or 144 this way? The mindset is key, but also understanding the variables and ownership, you could win on that a lot. Right. That's why I say I'm not against projection models. I'm an analytical person, and I don't use projection models. And I, I use a projection. Technically, I'm doing it in my head, but I don't need to know Christian McCaffrey is 18.7. I could look at Christian McCaffrey's matchup and the price and go and look and go, I think he's 40% chance of getting 15 points, right? Like, I think, uh, you know, he has a 10% shot at getting 30, right? I, I'm i making those graphs. These, these, fucking, these fucking things, I'm doing this in my head, right? It's the same thing of doing a projection model. It's the same, you, can, you can quantify this if you want, right? On the DFS side of things. I do it in my head. But that's the mindset. People thinking in terms of of uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play I'm not gonna play Mahomes against the Jaguars. Well if it was minimum price you would, right? If it was a minimum price quarterback, of course you would. So you can't just go by well what's the scoring system? What we see FanDuel, like we have guys that you know that like this guy's minimum price, and then, then you look at the you look at DraftKings and they're overpriced. And you go so when someone asks me, who do you think is the best play on Sunday? It's like, well, what side are you on? What games are you playing? Right? What, it, it, all of the other stuff matters. Not the play. Right? Didn't we, didn't we see like, the, like James, James Conner was 4,500? Like, but if he wasn't 4,500, if he was 7,500, he wouldn't have been the play. Complaining fan to all the draft games you need to do. Right. Wherever you encounter complexity, people are getting fucked. I don't really know what that means. People don't don't understand the complexity. Or don't understand, the, or a lot of times, don't understand there is no right answer. There's no, there's no right. Everything always depends. Do I play ace-queen under the gun? Uh, do I raise with ace-queen under the gun? Like, you, what game are you playing? What, what, is it shorthand? Are you six-handed? Are you ten-handed? Are you playing in a weak game? Are you playing in a tight game? Are you playing in a loose game? Are you playing no limit? Are you playing pot limit? Are you playing limit? All, like, all of that matters. You can't just say, uh, do I raise ace-queen under the gun? That That's the point that I'm making. DFS, like, do I play Christian McCaffrey on Sunday? Well, all the other stuff depends. What are you? What, what situation are you in? Whether with season-long stuff. I used to play season-long, whatever. And every time anyone asks me anything about season long, I just go fucking, I don't do season long. It's like, well, what did, should I start this guy or sit there? Well, what's your league? Okay, what are the standings, right? Who's your opponent? Who else is on your team? Who's on your opponent's team? Are you even playing the head-to-head -head league? Is it the type of, is it rotisserie style? All of that matters. All of it matters. So when you hear the fucking your fantasy radio bullshit, <coughs> fucking 7 million callers, I'm in a 14-team league. Should I pick a, how much fab money? Should I spend 18 bucks on Wendell Smallwood? Well, it depends on everything else in your league. Right? It depends. There's no right answer. You have to provide all of that context for then someone else to make a more accurate strategic decision than just, like, do I start or sit Jared Goff or uh, Jameis Winston? Right? You go, well, well, Winston's in a higher total game. Right? Maybe, but what happens if you tell me uh, you get bonus points for playing a guy with uh, the first name Jared? It's like, fuck, start Jared Cook, right? If you're getting a 2x multiplier for guys named Jared, right, then probably you should play Jared Goff over Jameis Winston. Now, that's an absurd example, but every I've seen leagues with fucking weirder goddamn rules, Right? Who knows? Who knows what the goddamn rules of the league, what what format and scoring system it is? Some are more standard than others. I get that. But that's why it depends. The answer is typically, to most questions that I get asked, is, is it depends. You would have to write four paragraphs before I could even come to an answer that could be somewhat accurate. So when I say I don't do picks, it's like, what's there to do picks of? Right? It depends on what you're playing. All of that stuff depends. I could say you could be more inclined. You could be more inclined. You could be less inclined. More likely to. More less likely to. James Conner, 4,500 that first week. Prob probably should be a staple of your cash games. 
in most cash games that you would consider playing, I guess, right? Probably applies to 99% of the situation. But there's some other, a lot of times it's just like, I think he's a good cash play. Is he the best cash play? Is he the best cash play given the roster construction? Given the things you could do? Give, like Marcus Valdez-Scantling allowed you to do other things in your lineup. So in and of itself, MVS wasn't a good play or a bad play. But in the context of the rest of your lineup, probably a better play than most people thought. So you have to think of all the other stuff. But it depends on what site you're playing on. DraftKings versus FanDuel versus anyone versus season long versus whatever game you're playing. Do you raise with Ace Queen under the gun? Well, it depends on what game you're playing. When playing multiple single entry cash games, will the foundational lineup be the same? Pretty, I mean, pretty much. But obviously, it depends on your opponent. Your your opponents are always going to be different. Is it going to be different enough where you make different lineups? Most of the times, not. Most of the time, the small percentages of let me look in this one dollar double up versus this one dollar double up with five hundred people. Like the disparity of your opponents, even if you knew what the disparity was, probably would make only a marginal difference on your decision making of what players you're playing. But if you're playing a five hundred dollar head to head, and you're playing a one dollar double up, those typically will be different. A lot of times in soccer, especially, I, I'll play a two, I'll play a high end head to head against a rando. Typically, I don't play against the other sharper guys. I'll see some I'll see some person I've never seen before post a five hundred dollar head to head. I take them and then I go under the assumption that they may make a mistake. So I'm going to play as straightforward as possible. Now, sometimes I play against people that tend to do certain things over others. One guy I used to play all the time tended to play whoever the whoever the highest goal scoring odds forward would always play. Pretty much it didn't matter. Whoever was the high, it could be Callum Wilson, didn't matter. You would see a lot of goal-dependent forwards in there. So I have to determine, like, do I just block and beat him with, and because he doesn't know how to pick defenders well, and beat him by three points by picking the right fullback? Or do I say, fuck it, let him take the high goal-scoring odds guy, and I'm just going to go with down the middle with a balanced lineup. That's an assessment I at least need to make. Sometimes on certain slates, I chose to block. Sometimes certain slates, I chose not to. But I knew my te the, the tendencies of my opponent that for that lineup, I did differently than in other double ups. Because your opponent, the difference in your opponent matters. You're playing one-on-one -on -one basketball against a seven-foot-two guy, probably you're not taking many jump shots where he's next to you. But you're probably faster than them, so you to dribble around them. But if you're playing a five, you know, five foot four guy that's really fast, maybe you take a lot more jump shots if you're a six foot five guy, right? I'm just using that as an example. I mean, just these variables, they, they exist. So treating like the variables don't exist. And that's what I hear on many, not all, many podcasts, DFS articles. Like, yeah, I know they have to write and make content for a vast majority of people. But still, you look at that and you have to weigh in and go, okay, here's generalized things. How does it apply to the games in which I play? What is the comparison of football that day and it disappeared? Your comment disappeared. I hope this is understandable. I don't know, if I, am I repeating myself? I don't, I don't want you to just like, oh, can I make charts and graphs? Just the mindset, the process, the thinking. The logic, the puzzle of logic to put into it. This is what I talk about when people ask me, what is the biggest tip you could give someone about daily fantasy sports? Is you think of it more as a game than as the sport. It doesn't mean you don't think of the sports. It doesn't mean it's not black or white. I think a lot of the DFS industry, it thinks too much in black and white. This guy's a cash claim play. This guy's a GPP play. Black, white, that's it. Like, that's wrong. Do you raise with ace queen under the gun? Black, white, that's it. You're wrong. Developing a process is the most underrated aspect of becoming a successful player. That's correct. But that's the biggest tip. But it's, it, but it's not something that has a right answer, which makes it 
99% of the playing public will listen to my advice and think I'm speaking gobbledygook because they just want to know if uh, Matt Ryan's going to throw three touchdowns this uh, Sunday. And I'm thinking of, well, what's the probability of him throwing three touchdowns? What's the probability of throwing him three touchdowns versus the salary that he has and the scoring system that you have for your site? FanDuel doesn't have the bonus, right? So if you don't get 300 yards, I mean, you don't get the extra points for that, right? You don't get the 100-yard bonus. That, that makes a difference. Christian McCaffrey is a better play, typically, on DraftKings versus FanDuel because the half PPR versus full PPR, right? All of those things depend. If you're telling me that you're, you're playing in a contest when, you know, all these schmucks are playing one guy and they're going to make horrible mistakes elsewhere, and you're like, I don't even like that guy. It's like, what would... If they're going to make so many mistakes elsewhere, just fucking play the guy. Play the guy that, that you don't even like. But if you think that your opponents are weaker than you and will make mistakes elsewhere in their lineup, but there's one guy that they're all going to play, why are you going to say fuck that? Why, why are you going to say fuck the guy that everyone's going to play? Because if that guy, if they get lucky with that guy, even if you think that that guy sucks, everyone has him. So you know, now you have to make sure that they make so many more mistakes than to make up the points that you don't have. So these are the strategic considerations. This is strategy. This is not. This is not a tactic. This is not a. This is what you do. Too many people are looking for what to do. What? 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 Can you give me your? I, I've gotten DMs. Can you give me your lineup? Like you can make your own fucking lineup. I don't sell lineups. You could make the lineup the same way that anyone else does. Well, I don't have the time to research the football. Like, you don't need the time to research the football. Other people do the research. That's why I read JM to win. That's why I read Evan Silva and Chris Raybon and the Roto World guys and the Roto Wire. I read a lot, but I'm not looking for he's a good play. I'm looking for all the other information. This guy, you know, the, the, the air yards, buy low, buy. I'm, okay, there's something to consider. But I still have to take all that information and then apply it to DraftKings and the contests that I'm in. But I want the information. But I don't have to go and dig up root, root trees. Someone's going to show me that. Someone's going to mention something. Someone's going to... It's going to be in a projection model somewhere, right? I'm going to look at Fantasy Labs. I'm going to look at Roto Grinders. I'm going to look at Daily Roto. I'm going to look at... I'd go, this guy's projected high for some reason. Why? Let me go. Let me read JM's column. Let me read this. Let me read... Oh, that's probably why he's projected a little high. Do I play him? Well, it depends on the salary. It depends on the con. It, it, then it comes to do I play him? But I don't start from the concept of let me read someone's picks, right? I'm going to read someone's picks, and here's their ten picks. Do I which one of these ten picks do I play? No, I would. I want to. I want to know all the information. I'll make the picks. I'll make the picks. I'll make the goddamn picks. So I hope that helped you. It probably didn't. As I said last time, you people listening, you don't fucking do anything. Right. Or you say, you say, oh, this is great information, and then you still fucking play fucking stupid. <laughs>